Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Daniel. This is the last in that series, lesson number 13 for March 28 of 2020, entitled, From Dust to Stars. Hmm, dust to stars, what could that mean? Well, that's what we're going to study for today. Let's begin, as always, with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you now, recognizing your presence with us and asking for the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we consider this very important final section in the book of Daniel. May the truths here become clear in our thinking as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> You could think of the book of Daniel as having bookends. It begins with Daniel, I'm sorry, it begins with Nebuchadnezzar conquering Judea uh, from Babylon. And then it ends with Michael standing up and delivering God's end time people from end time Babylon. So Babylon conquers Judea and then Judea conquers Babylon, huh? Throughout the book of Daniel, we find Daniel and his friends remaining faithful to their God through life-threatening situations. I don't know how many of us would be able to uh, stand up and while we're being thrown into a fiery furnace or into, into a den with lions, but <clears throat> that will also be true of those who stand up at the end of time, when there is a, a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, Daniel 12.1. Daniel 12 goes on to tell us that those who are wise will lead others to righteousness in verse 3. But let's go back to verse 1. Dennis? Daniel 12, 1. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is written, found written in the book, will be rescued. Uh, New American Standard Bible. I like what uh, the NIV said there, your protector. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. RSV says, uh, who has charge of his pe your people or something. But I like what uh, the NIV did, one of the few places I like the NIV. Yeah. You don't <clears throat> like the nearly inspired version? <laughs> or newly. Nearly inspired? One of the major challenges in this lesson is determining exactly who Michael is. We'll talk about that in several places through this lesson. From previous lessons, we have noted that the name Michael actually means who is like God or the one who is like God. But as we will see, there are a number of passages in Scripture which help to identify Michael, the archangel, as none other than Jesus Christ himself. As we stated in earlier lessons, Daniel 10 through 12 is really one continuous vision. In order to understand Daniel 12, our study for today, we need to look back at Daniel 11:40. Notice that it says, at the time of the end, in KJV. This tells us clearly that the events of Daniel 12 are not back in the days of Daniel, but actually will take place sometime in the future at what he describes, or what God describes as, the time of the end. Could we be in the time of the end even now? Yes. yes. I think so. We are. Yes, definitely. What does it mean to say that Michael will stand up? Well, elsewhere in Scripture, we read that kings who are ready to conquer or to rule stand up. In this case, Michael acts as a military leader to stand up on behalf of his people. As we know from the legal system, when someone stands in your place in a judgment setting, that person speaks on your behalf. Michael speaks on our behalf in that judgment. But that is no ordinary judgment. We are being constantly accused by Satan. You can read about that in Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 and Revelation 12, 10 to 12. In order for us to get a fair hearing before the court of the universe, Daniel 7, 9 to 14, it's all there if you have a chance to go back and read those passages, Michael must stand up on our behalf and speak the truth before the onlooking universe. So it, it's scary to think that what is coming at the end of time will be the most severe plagues and troubles that the world has ever seen. Unfortunately, after reading Revelation 15, 1, 
Many believe that it is God who pours out those plagues on the earth. However, Ellen White states clearly, The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed, and Satan has the entire control of the finally impenitent. God's long-suffering has ended. The world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, and trampled upon his law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. The Spirit of God, persistently resisted, has been at last withdrawn. Unsheltered by divine grace, they have no protection from the wicked one. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great final trouble. Now I'm going to interrupt there for a second. Who's plunging the world into these in the inhabitants of the earth? Satan. It's Satan. Okay. As the angels of God cease to hold and check the fierce winds of human passion. And that's Revelation 7 and 14, isn't it? Yes. All the elements of strife will then be let loose. The whole world will be involved in ruin more terrible than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. A single angel destroyed all the firstborn of the Egyptians and filled the land with mourning. When David offended against God by numbering the people, one angel caused that terrible destruction by which his sin was punished. The same destructive power exercised by holy angels when God commands will be exercised by evil angels when he permits. There are forces now ready and only waiting the divine permission to spread desolation everywhere. Well, that's some comment. Yeah. That's from Ellen and that's White. That's from Ellen White, The Great Controversy, page 614, 1 and 2. And, and, and I, I'd like, you know, every once in a while I, I challenge you to do something that I don't want you to do too much, and that's try thinking like the devil. So right now let's think about from a moment. Imagine an enormous group of people out there, individuals, not, not people, but these evil angels, who can hardly wait to destroy things. I mean, what is going on in their minds? They're working every day to that same end in our own mind. I mean, I mean, is this just misery loves company? Yeah, it doesn't seem reasonable. I mean, would think it's that if they were trying, when they if they were trying to uh, deceive the world to like them, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem like they would be there destroying them. Well, they but don't if, have the, they're not in touch with the giver of all good gifts, yeah. so they have nothing good to give. Mm -hmm. It's easier to destroy something than to build something. So but since they have no way to build, they destroy. What, what, what kind of people get delight out of destroying people? Somebody I mean, who hates somebody a yeah, whole lot. So, so if they hate God, they will try to destroy what is his. I mean, on the news today, this evening, before I came here, there were two girls sitting in a car on, on, beside the road, and someone came along and shot both of them. I mean, apparently for no reason whatsoever. I mean, what, what motivates people to do that kind of stuff? We've got Life whole generations that have had no moral bringing much at all, and warped at that. Do you some a sense of power if you've got the gun. Yeah. That's yeah. why some people get guns, is they have a sense of power, and when they feel totally powerless, that's a quick and easy way to sort of change it. Of course, it doesn't last forever. <laughs> well, the plagues are described in Revelation 16 with, in some detail, with some additional information in Revelation 18, 20 through 24. The one who is responsible for the plagues should be clearly should be clear from reading Revelation 16, 12 to 14. And I, I like to read that. Yeah. Huh? Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl in the great river Euphrates. The river dried up to provide a way for the kings who come from the east. Then I saw three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. They were coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. They are the spirits of demons that perform miracles. These three spirits go out to all the kings of the world to bring them together for the battle of the great day of Almighty God. Now, the question is, would God be sending forth 
demons, frogs, from the mouth of the devil, the dragon, you know, and so forth and so forth. I wonder what John thought when he wrote that down. Yeah. And did he really understand that? Yeah. Well, during those final days in this world's history, after the close of probation, nothing would be gained by the death of any of God's faithful people. So he will protect them through the seven last plagues. That doesn't mean they will be, be protected before the seven last plagues. Well, look at Daniel 7, 9, and 10. That's a famous, very important passage. While I was looking, things were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow. His hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on fiery wheels was blazing with fire, and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were open. So, we read about books, that passage, that were opened in heaven. And what are those books? What do they contain? There are two specific types of books mentioned in Scripture. One, there's one set of books which contains the names of those who belong to the Lord, sometimes designated as the Book of Life, where their names are written before the foundation of the, of the earth, this earth. Exodus 32, 32, Luke 10, 20, Psalm 69, 28, Philippians 4, 30, and Revelation 17, 8. And I would interrupt here for just long enough to say you can go to our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can get these handouts that we study together here if you would like. Then number two, God also has a complete and unerringly accurate record of everything that has ever happened on planet Earth, and that would be Psalm 60, 56, 8, Malachi 3.16, and Isaiah 65.6. 6. I'm going to read the one from Malachi 3.16. Then the people who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard what they said. In his presence there was written down in a book a record of those who feared the Lord and respected him. Okay? So we believe that the sins of the righteous will be dealt with in the judgment. However, we read... And this is from Signs of the Times, reprinted actually in SDA Bible Commentary. But it says, That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by the saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Okay, can I interrupt for a second? <clears throat> what is it about the cross that makes the angels of heaven secure? Any idea? I think it's a demonstration of what God is really like and what what, what the devil is like. Mm -hmm. that, and what he's willing to do uh, yeah. to save us. What Excuse happens when God. we when we separate from God. Yeah. Here you have at the cross pitted against each other, and the angels saw this. We didn't see it as humans, but the angels saw it. The the forces of evil pitted raw energy against raw energy against the forces of God. And they, okay, now we see exactly what's going on. Here's God in his, his side doing what he does, and here's Satan on his side doing what he does. And I think that's, that was the final point for them to say, there's no question in our minds anymore about who's in the right here. Okay, go Angelic ahead. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in Eden. The paradise of bliss all who wish for security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But repentance for sin alone cannot work the salvation of any soul. 
Man cannot be saved by his own works. Without Christ, it is impossible for him to render perfect obedience to the law of God, and heaven can never be gained by an imperfect obedience, for this would place all heaven in jeopardy and make possible a second rebellion. In a, in a word, that's really talking about that 1888 message and what that meant. Yep. It's his, not yep. ours. Yep. His perfection. It's We have to accept that gift. We have to accept, we have to open our minds to the working of the Holy Spirit and bringing in those ideas from the life and death of Jesus especially, getting that clear so that we, like the angels, are able to see that we want to reject absolutely completely Satan's side and accept God's side. And if, we, if we're willing to do that and gain the benefits of doing that, then it's safe for us to be in heaven. See, she wrote that in 1889, one yeah. year after the conference. That yep. Yeah. Most of our Adventist leaders kind of poo pooed. If the plan of salvation will provide, quote, an eternal safeguard against defection in heaven, will it be possible to study the plan of salvation without having access to the records about sin? What do you think? We'll have to have access to the museum and the record. I doubt if we'll be that interested in looking up our sins. Well, well, but we have to be able to see it to know. See what happened. To know why certain yeah. people aren't there, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, and even, even the bigger picture, to see how God has reacted to all this nonsense down through the years, because that's really what the plan of salvation is all about, isn't it? So we get mm -hmm. the rest of the picture there. So here's a question for you. The Bible contains a faithful record of the sins of almost every single saint, end quote. Will all Bibles have to be burned in order for all their bad deeds to be erased? No. No? So... What will we need what the would Bible? that do? I, I don't understand. What would burning the well, Bible... Well, there are, there are people who feel like that everybody who goes to heaven will have all record of their evils, any bad things they did, erased permanently from the record. Well, that means you would have to destroy all the Bibles because the Bibles are full of the sins of the saints. Oh, you mean the saints in Bible times? Yeah, in Bible times, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, well, I think it would have more to do with... Don't uh, you think that it's going to be a lesson book? Yeah. I mean, we can learn from that even as we study... The plan mm -hmm. of salvation, that's an, a lesson book yeah. as well to help us I to understand. I have a hard time believing that we'll be that interested in looking back and dwelling on that sort of well, thing. Well, but we just read up above there that the plan of salvation will be an eternal safeguard. Yeah. So we have, to, we have to learn something. Well, and I don't have to yeah. study my sins for the for Well, other in peoples. Revelation 20, when, when the saints during the thousand years are looking at and judging the, the, those who are lost, they would need to, to look at the books. Yeah. After that, though. Yeah, well, but the, the point is, we need, to, we need to get some picture of the whole overall process. I don't think it's necessary for us to look at one individual person's sins, and, but I, I, think, I think we have to have the overall picture of what's going on there uh, in order to study the plan of salvation. I mean, I, and the question is, how do you get the overall picture? How do you see the forest without focusing on the trees? And that's, I guess, what your question is. What is or will be really happening in this judgment? Is this a matter of bookkeeping? Or is there a real change that takes place in human beings? Change. Does, does, when, when Christ declares us not guilty, as opposed to Satan's claiming that we're guilty, is he... Declaring a falsehood, or is he declaring the truth? Would it be correct to say that only those who have been transformed by their relationship to or with to and with Jesus Christ will be saved? Would that include the thief on the cross? I think we have to look at ourselves as being forgiven. Mm -hmm. Well, it, but we must be born again also. Yeah. Yeah, that's healing. That process. Yeah. That's, yeah. It, we need healing. It's forgiven. Everybody's forgiven. That's that's just the way God is. Well, if we don't forgive others, Jesus said he won't uh, forgive us. Well, anyway. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting to, to think of all the ways you need to interpret those kinds of things. Okay? Yes. <clears throat> I'm reading from Daniel 12, verses 2 and 3. Many of those who have already died will live again. Some will enjoy eternal life and some will suffer eternal disgrace. The wise leaders will shine with all the brightness of the sky. And those who have taught many people to do what is right will shine like the stars forever. That's from the Good News Translation of the American Bible Society. Uh, keeping going here in the second verse, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And that's from the New American Standard Bible. That just gives us a little bit different yes, slant on it. Slant on, on the same verses there. Well, in these verses we read the most explicit reference in the Old Testament regarding resurrection. From this reference we should learn at least two things. One, the idea that the dead are sleeping indicates that there is no immortal soul that is floating around on a cloud somewhere. Two, Genesis 2-7 makes it clear that the body plus the breath or spirit makes a soul. Thus, we believe that the dead are unconscious and will remain so until the resurrection. So, do people, do God's people have any reason to fear death? Gordon? From the Good News Bible, Romans 8:18, 8, I consider what we suffer at this present time cannot be compared at all with the glory that is good to be revealed, that is going to be revealed to us. And Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, since the children, as he calls them, are people of flesh and blood, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. He did this so that through his death he might destroy the devil who has the power over death <clears throat> and in this way set free those who were slaves all their lives because of their fear of death. Okay, why would the fear of death make you a slave? How about Satan? Been a fear, fear of dying for an awful lot longer than us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lifelong bondage, I think the RSV says. Yeah. Well, it's natural for us living here on planet Earth to think that things come to an end when we die. But that is not God's plan for us. Daniel promises us, and this is repeated many times in the New Testament, that those who die in Christ will rise to eternal life. Does that give you hope? Mm -hmm. Despite the vicissitudes and problems here on planet Earth, we can look forward to a guaranteed future in a perfect environment. However, this does not mean that we can go on in our Laodicean ways. God is calling us to arise and act. Daniel 2, 4. He said 12, to me, 12. excuse me, excuse me, Daniel 12, 4. He said to me, and now Daniel, close the book and put a seal on it until the end of the world. Meanwhile, many people will waste their efforts trying to understand what is happening. That's from the Good News Bible. Daniel 12, 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. That's a New King James Version. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. There were many years when the publishers of the Signs of the Times magazine, every two or three years would put a cover on, had the latest, maybe it's a steam engine and maybe it, then it's an airplane and then it's a fancy car and so forth and then whatever like this. So, hey, you know, it's showing the more rapid transportation and better, better communication and so forth, these things. And these are the things that indicate we're at the end of time. But is that exactly what the Bible had in mind? What is this, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase? Go ahead and read Amos 8 and 12. That might help us. Amos 8, 12. People will wander from the Dead Sea to the Mediterranean and then on from the north to the east. They will look everywhere for a message from the Lord, but they will not find it. Good news, Bible. So what does that mean? What is it the people are going to look, be looking for at the end of time? Word of the Lord. It, from the Lord. Trying to understand the word of the Lord. And who's supposed to be available to help them? God's people. 
God's people. That's what we should be supposed to be doing at the end of time. And it's not, it's not going to be easy. I mean, Christians are being killed in parts of the world as we speak. Okay, Jim, go ahead. John fourteen twenty nine. I have told you this now before it all happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Good news, news Bible also. It seems strange to us the prophecies that Daniel revealed to that I'm sorry that God revealed to Daniel should be sealed up. Why would you give a prophecy and then seal it up? That doesn't that seem for, the, for because it was for a later time. In Revelation, we seal uh, see a book being unsealed. Mm -hmm. But if you if you if it's for a later time, why don't you just wait till a later time and give it to a prophet in the later time? Well, we show how far. Ahead, God can foretell that okay. things are happening. Okay. So this is clearly one point that God says, I'll lay it all out for you. You can see that I understand in advance this is what's going to happen. And he does, but he doesn't tell us that, okay, I'm going to predict in advance so you can, you can know in advance before it happens what's going to happen, but you will be able to see what? When it happens, you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, look at that. That's exactly what God predicted. So from the above verse, we understand that God chose to make this revelation in Daniel, whether or not he fully understood it, so that those of us living at the end of this world's history can look back and see that God knew in advance what was going to happen. There are many aspects to these final events, many of which are touched on in the book of Daniel. And of course, who are, the, who are the two main books that we Adventists really focus on as we, as we try to understand the final events of this earth's history? Daniel and Revelation. Daniel and Revelation. And uh, if you, you look at the commentaries from other peoples, other, other groups, you find out that the most confusing sections of all and the most wild speculations about meanings are in Daniel and Revelation. Yeah. What a surprise. The next big question which we should ask is, what did God mean when he said to Daniel, the time of the end? Okay. The Apostle Paul warned. Dennis? Go ahead, no. no. Go ahead. No, I, I, I was just going to okay. look something up. The Apostle Paul warned the church not to look for the coming of Christ in his day. That day shall not come, he says, except there come a fallen way first, and that man of sin be revealed, 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Not till after the great apostasy, what, what, would what would that time be? The great apostasy? Dark ages. The dark ages, okay. Well, and and the, long, in the long period of the reign of the man of sin? That's can, certainly that's the dark ages. Dark ages. Yeah. yeah. Can we look for the advent of the Lord? The man of sin, which is also styled the mystery of iniquity, the son of perdition and that wicked, represents the papacy, which, as foretold in prophecy, was to maintain its supremacy for 1260 years. <clears throat> this period ended in 1798. The coming of Christ could not take place before that time. Paul covers with his caution the whole of the Christian dispensation down to the year 1798. It is this side of that time that the message of Christ's second coming is to be proclaimed. So who's supposed to do that? We are. God's people living in this time, right? Mm -hmm. No such message has ever been given in past ages. Paul, as we have seen, did not preach it. He pointed his brethren into the then far distant future for the coming of the Lord. The Reformers did not proclaim it. Martin Luther placed the judgment about 300 years in the future from his day. I don't know exactly how he arrived at the 300 years, but that's what, that's what he said. But since 1798, the book of Daniel has been unsealed, knowledge of prophecy has increased, and many have proclaimed the solemn message of the judgment near. Great Controversy 356. So why, why did everything sort of open up in 1798? What happened in 1798? The French Revolution. Yeah, right? the Pope lost his power. The Pope was taken into captivity yeah. and died that same year. But there were things that happened before that. Remember what happened in 1755? Lisbon earthquake. earthquake. 
We read on when the Lisbon earthquake killed thousands of people in 1755, and 25 years later there was a dark day and the moon turned to blood in northern New England, people began to look at the prophecies in the Bible and say, maybe we are approaching the end of this world's history. I mean, it looks, you know, if you, if you see those prophecies being fulfilled, what are, you, what are you thinking? And there was a great, what we call a great religious awakening. There was Bible societies established in England and places like that. And they started saying, well, how can we preach the gospel to the Chinese and to the Indians and so forth like this, the South Indians, if we don't have Bibles in their languages? So they started translating the Bibles into a whole bunch of different languages. So a lot of things happened about that time that really set the stage for the end of time. I'm sorry, the time of the end. In 1975, I was teaching at La Sierra and I took a group on an out, outward bound type experience called Quest On. It's a bicycle trip from Canada to Mexico. We got down to the border crossing the river to Astoria, Oregon. It was raining so hard, we were hoping to find some place to get out of the rain rather than camping. And somebody said, well, you might go up here. There's a young uh, Nazarene pastor that has a house for men and one for women right next to it. Maybe he can take you in. So we went up and introduced ourselves to the people that were in there. And you know, there were two guys in there that said, well, our pastor is down at the library. So he needs to say it's okay if you stay here. And you know what they were doing? Studying Daniel. <laughs> two guys were sitting at the kitchen table working on Daniel with writing their own charts, copying things down. I was really intrigued with that because wow. it showed an interest in Scripture. This is 1975 in Astoria, Oregon. Wow. Just a wonderful, we stayed the weekend there. The fulfillment of Daniel yeah. right there that we Knowledge just read. It will just... be increased. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dennis, or is it Margaret? At the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, a new interest in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation was awakened in widely separated places of the earth. The study of these prophecies led to a widespread belief that the second advent of Christ was near. Numerous expositors in England, Joseph Wolfe in the Middle East, Manuel Lacunza in South America, and William Miller in the United States, together with a host of other students of the prophecies declared on the <coughs> basis of their study of the prophecies of Daniel, that the second advent was at hand. Today, this conviction has become the driving force of a worldwide movement. This is F.D. Yeah. Nickel, editor, article on Daniel, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 4. And many of you, have, have you had a chance to look at the story of Manuel, Manuel Lacunza? No. no. This guy wrote a lot of stuff about the advent, in Spanish, of course, in South America. But he realized because he was a he was, I think officially a Roman Catholic priest. Anyway, he was a one of the leaders in the Roman Catholic Church, and he realized that if he started writing this kind of stuff, he was going to be up against the church leadership. So he wrote under a pen name. Ah. And when the church found out about it, they banned everything that was published by this pen name, but some copies of it got to England, if I remember the story correctly, and they translated into English, and then back into Spanish, or, or somehow got it, and published it like this, and started sending them back to South America. <laughs> to, uh, and so it's just amazing the way God has worked sometimes to, to try to fulfill some of these, these prophecies we're studying about. Well, the great spiritual, that great spiritual awakening led up to the great disappointment of 1843 and 1844, and ultimately to the founding of the Seventh-day Adventist Church about 20 years later. Shortly thereafter, the ministry of Ellen White began. Now we have numerous versions of the Bible as well as Ellen White's writings available to us in electronic formats, which are easily retrievable and searchable. As a result, no generation of people in history have had the amount of inspired material readily available to them that we have. We should be the most educated people of all time in regards to the truths of the Bible and the events of the time of the end. So we are, right? Yep. 
Should be. Don't everybody say opportunity. that with we a great like resounding to, yes. We like yes. to think we are. We like to think we are. Well, the, in Daniel 8, that's one of the things I was looking up here. It, it says, after the uh, uh, Son of Man understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Mm -hmm. That's after the, eight, you know, the Daniel 8, 14. So this is in set for 17. So it's talking about that vision, about the sanctuary being cleansed. So, And why do you think it is that when we can lay out those details and the prophecies and all the dates fit together and they can be verified by other things like this, why is it that so many of our friends don't want to hear it? Because not even God can predict the future, they say. Well, I mean, I, I don't think they all reject it. I hope they don't all reject it just because of that reason. Um, that would be sad if it's really true. That's definitely a number of people do. But a lot of people, I think, reject it just because they will say, and rightly so, that if you accept this, all this prophecy and our interpretation, you're almost forced to become a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, look at Daniel 12, 5 to 13. Then I saw two men standing by a river, one on each bank. One of them asked the angel who was standing further upstream, how long will it be until these amazing events come to an end? The angel raised both hands towards the sky and made a solemn promise in the name of the eternal God. I heard him say it will be three and a half years. When the persecution of God's people ends, all these things will have happened. I heard what he said, but I did not understand it. So I asked, but sir, how will it all end? He answered, you must go now, Daniel, because these words are to be kept secret and hidden until the end comes. Many people will be purified. Those who are wicked will not understand, but will go on being wicked. Only those who are wise will understand. From the time the daily sacrifices are stopped, that is, from the time of the awful horror, 1290 days will pass. Happy are those who remain faithful until the 1,335 days are over. And you, Daniel, be faithful to the end. Then you will die, but you will rise to receive your reward at the end of time. And that's the end of the book of Daniel. In these verses, we have three prophecies. There's one about the 1,260 days or years referred to in a number of places in Scripture. Where else do we find it besides in the book of Daniel? Revelation? Uh, several places in the book of Revelation as well. Sometimes it's referred to as a 1260 days. Sometimes it's referred to as, as uh, three and a half years. Sometimes it's referred to as 42 months. And all those work out if you count 30 days for a month. They all work out to be the same time period. And the passages where that's referred to are in our handout if you want to look it up. The other prophecies besides the 1260 day year prophecy are the 1290 day year prophecy and the 1335 day year time periods. We will first deal with the 1260 day year time period. So as we already know, that period of papal supremacy extended from about AD 538 to 1798. During that time, Roman suppression and murder of faithful Bible believing Christians was severe. So how what happened in 538 that made this the beginning of this period? Do you remember? Well, the Roman Empire. Okay, remember the, that in the yeah. 300s, Constantine came along, but he wasn't comfortable living in the western part of the, yeah. the empire. So he moved the capital of the Roman Empire over to Constantinople, Constantinople. and he named it after himself. But that left a kind of power vacuum in the west. And so who was more or less in charge in the West? Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome, and he gradually got more and more power. And in 538, what happened? There was an attack. The, the city had been attacked several times. What? Barbarians. Barbarians had attacked and so forth. And on, on that occasion, the Pope went forth with a relatively small group of people and conquered a much larger army. And he came back with the idea, whoa, 
I, I can be not only a spiritual leader, I can be a civil and a military leader. And all of a sudden, what do you have together? You've got civil, military, religious power all wrapped up together. And when you have civil and military and, and, and religious power all wrapped together, what do we call that in the Bible? A beast. Oh, <laughs> a beast. Yeah. And represents papal supremacy. <laughs> yeah, a beast represents, in, in this case, it's a horn or something like that. Well, the, the, the Pope there in uh, what, 538, mm -hmm. uh, the, what he, the armies that he d destroyed were three of uh, the barbarians. So we can reference the three mm -hmm. horns plucked up and yeah. the other one coming up in its place. Well, these people st would have claimed to be Christians, but they were Arians. They did not believe that Christ existed before he appeared on this earth. And so he was regarded by the Roman, by the, the very staid traditional Catholic and the, and, the, and the Pope as being heretics, okay? So those the people of those, the soldiers of those three nations were apparently overcome by malaria mm -hmm. for, when they tried to break down the aqueduct system mm -hmm. and the land flooded and all the local people were immune to malaria, relatively immune. Relatively. And so they went out with their small army and destroyed all these Six soldiers. Yeah. Well, during that period, from 538 to 12, 1798, and that's a period of how many years? 1260. 1260 years. During that time, Roman suppression and murder of faithful Bible-believing Christians was severe, and of course, we know the history. Here's several texts that talk about this part of that period. Daniel 7:25. He will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to challenge their religious, change their religious laws and festivals, and God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. That's from the Good News Bible. Also from Good News Bible, that's in Revelation now, instead of Daniel, Revelation 11:3. I will send my two witnesses dressed in sackcloth, and they will proclaim God's message during those 1260 days. And going to Revelation 12, 6, and 14, the woman fled to the desert to a place God had prepared for her where she will be taken care of for 1260 days. She was given the two wings of a large eagle in order to fly to her place in the desert where she will be taken care of for three and a half years, safe <coughs> from the dragon's attack. Good news, Bible. All emphasizing the three and a half years. What about Revelation 13, 5? You got that there? The beast was allowed to make proud claims which were insulting to God, and it was permitted to have authority for 42 months. Again, so, three and a half yeah. years. So why do you suppose God, in some places, says 1260 days, in other places, says three and a half years, in other places, he says, and some of it's in the Old Testament, and some's in the New Testament, Sometime here we have 42 months. Why? Why Didn't is he trying to so confuse redundant. us? He wanted to make us think. Make us think, huh? <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> there are two other time periods about which we have very little information. One extends for 1,290 days or years, and the other the thir for 1,335 days or years. What do we know about those? The other two time periods... 1,290 and 1,335 days answer a question. Quote, what shall be the end of these things? Unquote. That's from New King James Version, posed by Daniel himself to the man clothed in linen. And both begin with the removal of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. From the lesson of, on Daniel 8, we learn that the daily refers to the continual intercession of Christ, which was replaced with a counterfeit worship system. Thus, the prophetic period should start in A.D. 508 when Clovis, king of the Franks, converted to the Catholic faith. 
Let's stop here for a second. <clears throat> we just suggested that the 538 date was sort of become, became important because the Bishop of Rome did what? Came took on religious and civil authority. Took on civil and military authority. Now what's happening up north in France? About 30 years earlier. 30 years earlier? The uh, king becomes Catholic. Catholic. The king becomes Catholic and therefore he thinks that he will not only exert his civil and military authority as king, but he will include, include with that Union. his religious authority, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Persecution. Union between church and state which held sway throughout the Middle Ages. Hence, 1,290 days ended in 1798 when the Pope was arrested by the French Emperor Napoleon. It's very interesting, and I keep interrupting here, uh, interesting to notice that this 1290-year period begins with a French king and ends with a French king who arrested the Pope. Yeah. And 1,335 <coughs> days, the last prophetic period mentioned in Daniel, ended in 1843. This was the time of the Millerite movement and renewed study of the biblical prophecies. It was a time of waiting and hope in the imminent coming of Jesus. That's from the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Very good. <clears throat> so over the years of my study in schools and so on and Sabbath School, I've heard a lot about 1260 days and yeah. so on. Yeah, mainly just that. Yeah, 1290 when I heard that, when we were actually at the church where, at the cathedral where Clovis was converted, I said, where's that come from? Yeah. And the 1,335 days, you know? That sure fits our picture. I, I didn't remember yeah, that. that. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. ever remember hearing that. No, I know, I didn't. 1335, yeah. how it comes out to, yeah. it just fits the picture of the Millerite movement. Next to the last verse of Daniel. So what have we seen through these final stages, the prophecies of Daniel? Well, we have evidence that God's people have been persecuted repeatedly down through the years, haven't they? Yes. Many have been martyred, but ultimately God's faithful people will be vindicated and will live forever with him in heaven. And what do we have, what promises do we have about what's going to happen to those people? We just, I just read a moment ago, a little bit ago. We know about this special resurrection and what happens in the special resurrection. Those who have been God's faithful people, special representatives will be raised to, uh, to see the second coming. And those who have been his most awful, worst opponents will be raised. So, uh, and, and, and to see, remember what, remember what Jesus said to Caiaphas there in, in the in the, during the trial there, what he said, you will see the, see the Son of Man coming in the right hand of power, right? Mm -hmm. And that okay. isn't talking about the third coming. That's talking about the second coming. Yep. So just a thought, how long do these people who don't get to live for the next thousand years, are they there for two hours? Are they killed Good with the brightness question. of he coming when it gets too close? I mean, that's a very good question. I've, I've struggled with that, too. Can't be very long. Yeah. It, yeah. How but, long will it take them to get ready to try to take the new Jerusalem? But that's, the that's talking, coming. you're talking about at the third coming. That's He's asking about these people who were raised in the special oh. resurrection before the second coming. How long were they and survived? They aren't the faithful. They're the exact yeah. opposite. The yeah, most the sinful, the most rebellious. Yeah. Somehow they have, crucified him. They have to be make, make sense that they're around long enough to get oriented, figure out what's going on, what's happened the last several hundred years, and understand what's coming. Yeah, and realize what they're and missing. What kind of bodies do they have? And yeah, we'll probably be raised in the in, in just as they were. The same state as they left. Yeah, but the question I would Still have is. Breath. Imagine Caiaphas looking up, and here's Jesus coming in the clouds. How long will it take for him to recognize him? 
it won't take long. Yeah. I think that those words will come back full force. Wow. Like a clobber in the That'd face. Be something right? to see, wouldn't it? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Well, one of the questions that could be raised, is there any reason why we should look forward to further time prophecies to be fulfilled? Is there any evidence in Scripture that there are further time prophecies? Well, it sure looks like it in Revelation. Well, but time prophecies extending how far? Not specifically connected to a period of time. We have events prophesied, yeah. clearly, but not connected to a specific time. Well, look at Daniel 14, 29 again. I have told you this now. This is John Jesus. 14. John, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. John 14, 29. Jesus talking to his disciples in that last evening together. I have told you this now before it all happens so that what? When it does happen, you will believe. The prophecies that we already have from Daniel and Revelation need to be read and reread until we understand them. Then when these events take place, we will realize that God knew in advance what was coming. So, back to our question we sort of started out with. What evidence do we have that Michael is Christ? This is a point about which very few people, very few of our fellow Christians agree with us. Do we have adequate scriptural support for our belief? Michael and or Michael the Archangel is mentioned several times in scripture. We've already looked at Daniel 12, 1. Let's look at that real quickly. The angel wearing linen clothes said, at that time the great angel Michael, who guards your people, will appear. So there's one <laughs> reference. If we go back to the earliest known history in the known history, the history in heaven, we read in Daniel 12, 7 to 9, then war broke out in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels, but the dragon was defeated. He and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. So you don't have very many choices for Michael if he's up there fighting against the, Satan in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> um, I've often wondered in this subject, we call him Michael, the archangel. Scripture calls him that. That's another name for Jesus. Jesus was his human, human name. name. At one time, did he, as God's son, seem to be another angel? Yes. So, Lucifer on one side mm -hmm. and Michael on the other side. Yes. Good friends standing for next, how long? Standing how, how next long to the angels still. were there before. Yep. Satan got this insane idea. Didn't even recognize who Michael was, evidently. Well, let's look at a couple more places. Jude 9. Not even the chief angel, Michael, there it is again, did this in this quarrel with the devil. And we're now beginning to see that every, almost every time Michael is mentioned, he's in direct conflict with the devil. The devil. When they argued about who would have the body of Moses, Michael did not dare to condemn the devil with insulting words, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And then um, there is even more convincing evidence when we read 1 Thessalonians 4.16. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died, believing in Christ, will rise to life first. So, they're going to rise at the voice of the archangel. archangel. And if we go to John 5, 28 and 29, we read, Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves. And of course, it's, if we read 27, and he has given the Son of Man the right to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice. Whose voice are they hearing? The Son of Man, right? And right. come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live, and those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. So, so the Son of Man and the Archangel, Michael, are the same. Yeah. It yeah, says, yeah. what? Yeah. The two passages, uh, Jude and First Thessalonians, are the only two places in the Bible where the term archangel is mentioned. And what? so the, that kind of connects uh, yeah. 
uh, there. And of course, archangel just means the highest messenger. Yeah. Um, well, Daniel 12, 2, and Matthew 26, 63, and 64, and Revelation 1, 7, along with Revelation 14, 13, imply that there is a resurrection that will occur at the end when both righteous and wicked will arise together. From the uh, SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, a special resurrection precedes Christ's second advent. All who have died in the faith of the third angel's message will arise at that time. In addition, those who behold who beheld with mockery Christ's crucifixion, and those who have most violently opposed the people of God will be brought forth from their graves to see the fulfillment of the divine promise and the triumph of truth. And then from Ellen White, Great Controversy, Graves are opened, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Can I interrupt for just a second? Notice many of them will sleep in dust. The title of our lesson is From Dust to What? Stars. Okay, so here's the dust. All, all who have died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. Those also which pierced him, Revelation 1, 7, those that mocked and derided Christ's dying agonies, and the most violent opposers of his truth and his people are raised to behold him in his glory and to see the honor placed upon the loyal and the, dis and the obedient. That special resurrection mentioned in these verses is not that general resurrection of the righteous at the second coming or of the wicked at the third coming. One can get all tangled up in trying to understand the details of the prophecies in Daniel. So, one final note. Jim? A group of college students was frustrated with their struggle to understand the book of Daniel. So, they went to the gym to play basketball. After their game, they noticed that the care old caretaker was sitting in the corner reading. What are you reading, Joe? They asked. The book of Daniel, he replied. Oh, you can't understand that. Yes, I can, Joe replied. It's quite simple. God wins. <laughs> Very good. So what are our own spiritual aspirations? Where do we want to be? Do we want to live through those final terrible times of plagues and so forth? Or would you rather sleep during that time? Well, we'll, let that, we'll leave you with that question. Our kind and loving Father, it has been a great privilege to study once again the book of Daniel and to try to understand as many of the details as possible. We thank you for this opportunity we have to give such a presentation here in this group. May it be a help to many as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.